Good morning, church family. I, like the rest of you, am struggling with allergies this morning, so please bear with me. There is uh, one, two people, oh, that's really loud, two people I'd like to add to our prayer list this morning. Yesterday we got to celebrate the wedding of Kevin and Brianna, and there they are there, beautiful couple, but uh, as we know, marriage is not an easy walk, so please, please, please be praying for them, uh, reach out to them, encourage them. It's so happy. It was so exciting to see their faces yesterday. Um, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to have Mr. Richard Leggett here from the Gideons and explaining what the Lord is doing through that ministry it is just as important to look at what the Lord is doing and how his hand is working now as it is to study how he has worked in the past. So Mr. Leggett is going to share with us uh, what the Gideons are up to, how they're seeking the Lord, and, and how they're walking and planting seeds out there in the community that, guess what? We can reap that harvest, us. So... Um, there's also, just so you know, the Gideons are not a closed group. They are not. I'm still staticky. Oh, that's too much. All right. You know what? I'll stand still today. How's that? I'll try. My arms are going to be flailing around, just so you know. Um, the Gideons are not a closed group. If you have interest, if you have any desire or... Uh, you think, wow, what would it be like to share God's word with the people out there? Uh, please speak with Richard. I was blessed in my walk, early on with my walk, to join this organization, and it was incredible. It was edifying to my faith. Uh, it was encouraging just to be able to put, where is it? I have one here, one of these into someone's hands. And this is Psalms, Proverbs, and the New Testament. Uh, we know from Scripture, the Word of God does not come back void. So it is not, it is such, and Richard, don't take this the wrong way, but it is such a passive way for us to share our faith and that we, we could just get it in someone's hands. See, it's so hard for me to stand still. We can just get it in someone's hands and then let His Word and His Spirit work in somebody. And that... As Mordecai said uh, to Esther, perhaps the Lord has brought you to the kingdom for a moment just like this. So this could be your calling. So please pray through that, and Mr. Leggett will be here for our uh, potluck afterwards to discuss this with you if you do have any interest. That being said, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord God, the day that you have made. We thank you for the rain. Lord God, we thank you for the spring. We thank you that we can all gather here together in your name. Lord God, your word says, your people shall know you by your name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak, here I am. And Lord God, you proclaim the word of your son that was to come, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And Lord God, we thank you for the victory that you've given us through your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the love that you've extended to him and through him, that we may be right and standing in your presence. Lord God, as the kids go downstairs and we remain upstairs, Lord, let us all meditate on your word. Give us peace of heart and give us a true understanding of the love and calling that you have for each of us. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if the children would like to go downstairs, with Miss Irma, they may do so.
<clears throat> and for the rest of us, we'll be reading uh, from the prophet Malachi, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Is that the door or am I still staticky? Oh, okay. All right. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you that you would shut the doors, that you might not kindle a fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to the setting, it's my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And you bring this as your offering. Shall I accept it from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations." But one of the first things you learn about preaching is that you're supposed to preach with authority. You're supposed to preach with power. I would say that if a man is honest, there is no way that he can preach the scripture with authority or with power. J.C. Ryle says that if you give a man a Bible and a pen and a pad, He'll know the depth of his depravity very soon. And as you look at this particular text, it's very easy to do that. So as I'm speaking to you today, understand that this is first coming to me and I'm preaching to myself, not out of authority, but out of understanding of my need for a savior and the understanding of my need for sanctification. It's very easy when you start with looking at another group of individuals, and that's what we're doing here. We're looking at God's relationship with Israel, with the Jews that were returning out of exile. This was 450 years, some odd, before uh, the time of our Lord. And the prophet speaks to the nation of Israel after the erection of the temple and when uh, polluted offerings were being offered there as, as uh, a tribute to the Lord. Now, it's interesting because when you look at the priests that were offering this and you understand God's calling on them, God's purpose for them, and God's anointing, my goodness, what a blessing these men had. Does anyone know what the highest position in the kingdom of Israel was? It wasn't the king, it was the priest. The king governed, the king served, but the priest was to act as an intermediary between God and man. The priest was to offer up sacrifices. The, the priest was to step into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would. And we see here that the priests are now stepping in and they're offering sacrifices that are just good enough. God doesn't call the good enough. God calls us to be holy, to be set apart. God calls us into perfection. 
We look at the, the, the process of what it would be for a high priest to enter into the temple itself. There would be a period where they would be clothed and where they would be cleansed. This should be a time of reflection where one looks upon themselves and understands exactly the depth of depravity that they're being cleansed from. My goodness, out of the understanding of this and the fact that the Lord, the Lord started this, this letter, this prophecy by saying, I have loved you. I have loved you. I've bestowed my love upon you. How could you not just want to give everything? How could you ever say this is just good enough? Well, once again, we're looking at a different time and a different people, and I'm not here to talk about the, the punitive nature of what animal sacrifice was at that time. This isn't about that. And this isn't about the quantity, but it's about the quality, and it's not even about the quality of the, the sacrifice itself. It's about the quality of the heart of the person who is sacrificing. There, there's, there's nothing wrong with these animals if they're lame or they're sick. My goodness, the Lord's word says, <coughs> excuse me, hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept the bull from your house or goats from your fold, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, the lame and the sick God has created. When we look at somebody who is struggling from a physical malady, or we look at somebody who's struggling emotionally or mentally, we understand that God can be glorified through that person. It's the same thing through, through the animals that were being sacrificed. But God calls the perfect not because there's anything wrong with the lame or the sick. The lame or the sick are his too. It's about the heart of the giver, the heart of the giver to look and say, this is everything I have, Lord, and it is yours. It is absolutely yours, and I want, it, I want to give it to you. This was coming in a time when animals were not <clears throat> pets. You didn't... You didn't Look at cows and just like every time you drive by a field and you're like, cow, it wasn't like that. They were utilitarian. They gave you food. They helped with labor. And you're saying to God, you know what, God? All of this is yours. All of this is yours. I'll sacrifice the food that should be for my own body, Lord, for you because it is all yours. Because of the love that you bestowed upon me. Because of the lack of love that I bestow upon you. The Lord says, I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. This is what we're to sacrifice to God. It's about our heart. From the first sacrifice that we read in the Bible, if we go back to Genesis 4, we, we understand the sacrifice of, of Cain and of Abel. And God accepted Abel's sacrifice. Why? Because it was, it was animal? No. God made the produce as well. But when Cain was over there sulking, the Lord comes and he says to him, he speaks to him with grace. He says, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. He's warning Cain. You're doing the wrong things. Your heart is not pure. We worship a God. We are created by a creator that is that constantly gives us a new beginning and a new beginning. And that was our promise, not only to us through Christ Jesus, but it was a promise to Israel as well. Through the prophet Malachi, we'll later read that he, the last exhortation that he gives to them is return to me. Return to me and I will return to you. Have faith in me. Have faith in the future hope of my son that will come to redeem you. That's grace. But grace, it does not come without the, the understanding of how far we have fallen. As we look at the prophet Malachi, I can't think, 
I can't think of a worse thing to hear from the voice of my creator than, oh, that there were one among you that would shut the doors. Imagine hearing from the voice of God last night, just, just don't even come tomorrow. Just stop. Do, well, do we really think, do we really think that God needs us here when we look at the idea of worshiping through song, who are, who are we actually serving through that? My goodness, does it not fill your heart with joy? I get to lift my voice to the, to the most holy. I get to sing my praises to my creator. I get to sing my praises to my redeemer. My goodness, that should fill your heart. The heart that he has given you that would beat for him. The Lord says in, in, in verse 8, when you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present those to your governor. Will he accept them and show you favor? What he is saying here is, understand, as, as these folks came back from exile, as, as Cyrus released them, he placed a governor over the top of them. It wasn't a Jewish governor that would be over the top of them. It was a person that was looking for them to mess up. It was looking, uh, he was looking for them to cause them reason to, to bring them again before the king. I know that we see and we look at Cyrus as a good guy as releasing the Jews, the, the, but understand that the kings of this world, their heart is like a stream in the hands of the Lord. He turns them to and fro in, in, in whatever way he wishes, understand that the Lord ordained the Jews to go back, but he did it through the, 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 uh, the mind of Cyrus who said, okay, I will expand my kingdom by returning all the exiles, and they'll now fill this area, and I have greater tax revenue, I have a greater land mass, I have greater resources. He wasn't a friend of the Jews. He had no mercy toward them. The Lord is saying, what you are offering, are you just offering it because you think it's good enough because I show you mercy? I show you mercy because I love you. Now we live, we live in a different time. Thanks be to our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, who came to redeem us. We understand since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. If we jump ahead to Hebrews 7, it says that, that Jesus offered once and for all a sacrifice for all sins. That was himself. That's the love that God has for us. That's the redemption and, and the, the, the depth and, and the, how far he would go to redeem us. But understand, through that, just as God had called out to his nation uh, of Israel, he now calls to us through Peter, we read, you are a chosen race, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies. Notice the plural, the excellencies. God is not just excellent in one way, he is excellent in every way. Of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. His love is filled with excellencies. Therefore, Paul in Romans 12 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We walk forward. We put to death self day after day after day. Why? Because repentance is daily. The understanding of where we are and how we need him and how he loves us. 
That's a continuation of a walk. We don't say a prayer one time and then say, okay, I'm free and clear. No. By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is how we come to him. This is what we offer him. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind and the testing that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. So what do we bring to God? What is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect? Much of Jesus' teaching, if we look through Matthew, is on, is on giving. And we know one thing, it's not about the abundance of our giving. Once again, we're not talking about quantity here. We're talking about quality and the quality that comes from the heart. We know that on the last days, there's going to be many that come before them and flash their resume in front of the Lord. And they're going to say, look at everything that I've done for you. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Just shut the doors. So what does the Lord look for? My goodness, it's so easy. The sacrifices of God, David says, Psalm 51, are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, this you will not despise. It's the understanding that we come before him, that we are broken that what we offer him can never be good enough because what he has offered us is perfect. And he's offered us perfection. And he's offered it out of perfect love. And look around. Look around here today. Imagine just the love that he has for those that are in this room. That he loves each and every one of you infinitely. He loves each and every one of you in a way that doesn't just contain excellence, but excellencies. That's love. That's why when Paul talks about giving, and he's talking about this monetarily, but he he says each one of you must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What makes us cheerful? What changes our heart from a heart that looks like Cain that does something out of of obligation and turns it into something that we're cheerful, we're joyful? It's his love. It's the fact that he loves us. It's the understanding of the depth and perfection of that love. Now, I'd like to say, man... Israel, you got it wrong, but man, we got it wrong too. Brian has it wrong. So many times you do things and, and, and you do things and, and you're like, man, yeah, all right, I guess I got to do that. No, anything that is, that is a service to the Lord, man, it, you got to do with a smile on your face. You got to pause and say, God, and I do this every Sunday morning. I pray my way through Psalm 51. Cleanse me that I may proclaim your greatness. It's only through his righteousness that we can serve him. Otherwise, as Isaiah says, all our good deeds are like filthy rags before a holy and righteous God. And it's out of the love for that cleansing, it's out of the love for that righteousness that he clothes us with, that we can serve him truly. That we can serve him wholly. And that we can serve him in a way that he desires. Like I said, I preached this to myself this week. There's so many times when I start out the week and I'm like, man, this is really cool. And God's word cuts me to the bone. God's word is like a double-edged sword. And that's what Mr. Leggett is here to talk to us about. What it's like to get that into the hands of somebody who has the wrong impression of who God is. 
See, the world has two impressions of who God is. One is that he's a mean governor that sits upon his chair. He's this awful king that just sits there and waits to judge. And there's no way that I would ever deserve his grace. And that's so wrong. The other way is that I'm good enough. And if I stand before God one day, he'll just look at me and say, okay, you get a bye. That's not it either. But it's through the love and grace and understanding of Scripture. It's by hearing, hearing from the Word of God that we come to faith, that we trust in Him, we trust in His plan, we trust in His plan for salvation through His Son. And it's through guys like Richard that are out there distributing that Word that more and more people are coming to that true understanding of who God is and the love that He has for us day after day after day. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Richard Leggett up here to share with us what the Gideons are doing. Can I have one of those? This past Monday, I was standing on the corner of Brambleton and Pleasant Hill Drive which is the entrance to Hidden Valley High School. And I was participating in a Gideon scripture distribution. As I stood there and held out one of these Gideon New Testaments, a voice caught my attention. It was coming from the back of a Roanoke City school bus. And the guy on the back seat was saying, hey, can I have one of those? Well, I looked, make sure there was no traffic coming. And then I quickly walked over to the bus. I said, here, take two. And I gave him two copies of God's word. And then I ran back over to the side of the road. Those were two of the 63 copies of God's word that were distributed this past Monday to the students at Hidden Valley High School. A few moments later, a car drove up. There was two guys in there. And I said, would y'all like a Bible? And one of the guys said, well, are they free? I said, sure. So I handed one to each one of those students. A little bit later, a, a female teenager drove up, and she was sitting there at the, at the red light. And I kind of held up a Bible and said, would you like one of these? And she kind of shook her head, no. And they said, well, I guess so. So I was able to give her one through her open car window. A few minutes after that, another car stopped there at the light, and it was two guys in it. And I asked, would y'all like a free gift? And I handed them a Bible. And they said, what's this? I said, it's a Bible. And they smiled. And I walked back to the, my corner. Things seemed to be going pretty well. And then I noticed that a Roanoke County police officer uh, pulled his car into uh, the parking lot right next to where we were standing. And he got out of his car and he started walking to me. Uh, I prayed very quickly that uh, we would not have any legal problems and that he would allow us to continue with our distribution. And uh, the officer came up to me and said, well, you know, we've gotten a couple of calls about somebody down here stopping traffic. And I said, officer, I wouldn't be stopping traffic. I'm just giving out God's word. And I offered him a copy of God's word. He re uh, politely refused it, but he really didn't say anything other than, you know, I can't stop you from standing here on, on public property and giving, giving away or doing what you're doing. But he said, please stay out of the road. I said, I'll, I'll do my best, officer. So he drove off. And a few minutes after that, a, a gentleman, an older gentleman, uh, was sitting there at the light and had his window down. And I tried to engage him in a quick conversation. I said, would you like a New Testament? He said back to me, I've got plenty of those at home. I said, well, I hope you read them. And he drove off. So that was Monday afternoon of this week. On Tuesday afternoon, some of my fellow Gideon brothers were at Cave Spring High School. Their strategy was a little bit different because if, if some of you may know that there's a church almost directly across the street from Cave Spring uh, High School, and that's the Penn Forest uh, Worship Center. And that church has made some arrangements with 
the school so that uh, a number of, of students are allowed to um, park in the church parking lot so that they're close to the school. Well, the last couple of years, the Gideons have learned that if you're there when the, the school lets out, as people are walking back to their church or to their cars, you have a chance to offer them a New Testament. And over 50 copies of God's Word were distributed on Tuesday. So between Monday and Tuesday, over 100 students were given an opportunity to have a copy of the Word of God. Now, it sounds like most of you are very interested and very knowledgeable about the Gideon, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of history. The Gideon organization actually started in 1898, and the first Gideon Bibles were distributed in 1908. It took about 20 years before a million copies of God's Word were distributed, and that was in 1929. And believe it or not, the day before the 911 tragedy, the Gideons actually distributed their one billionth Bible. That was in 2001, and 15 years later, they were able to say they had distributed two billion copies of God's Word. As of about a year ago, we were up to 2.5 billion, and the latest figures I saw were 2.6 billion people had received God's word through the Gideons. Now, it's kind of interesting, I just saw a, a fact that the world's population is estimated to be approximately 7.9 billion people. And it's also estimated that about one third of those 7.9 billion people have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you think about that for a minute, one-third of 7.9 billion is 2.6 billion. So I figured out that if every person that had ever received a Gideon Bible would just share their Bible with one person that never heard the gospel, we'd have the whole world covered. I want to just tell you a, few, uh, a little bit about how I became a Gideon back in 2006. I was a member of church, and one of my fellow church members invited me to start going to a Saturday morning prayer breakfast. They met every Saturday at a local restaurant, and they had a time of prayer, and they enjoyed fellowship at, at breakfast. As I attended this group, I saw that they were committed men, men that God was using to reach their communities. I eventually joined this uh, group, which is called the uh, Roanoke City West Camp of the Gideons International. And over the years, I've been privileged to, to be able to do the two parts of the ministry that I really enjoy the most. Those are being able to speak in churches like this one and to be able to distribute God's word to students and to adults. And really, our, our biggest um, distribution in this area is a, a, an event that happens every year, and that's the Salem Fair. So for the past 10 years or so, the Gideons have sponsored a booth at the Salem Fair in the Civic Center, and we provide Gideon Testaments to anyone that, that's willing to walk by and, and to accept one. Let me just tell you one story about one individual that came to the fair. This was a, a gentleman that was pretty much down on his luck, very depressed, and actually that night was thinking about taking his own life. But as he walked around at the fair, one of the Gideon missionaries offered him a copy of the New Testament. The man continued walking around and was reading uh, in this, this copy of, of God's Word. And God was able to lead him away from the thoughts about wanting to, to take his own life. In fact, this man became a committed Christian, and one of his joys in life was to be able to share with others how God had rescued him from the valley of the shadow of death. So I'd like to tell you just a few ways that you too can be involved in the Gideon ministry. First and foremost, you can be involved through prayer. And one of the th first things I noticed today when I, when I arrived was that this church is a church of prayer. You, you list your prayer requests very prominently in, in your bulletin and it's obvious that, that you believe in prayer because prayer is the fuel that allows the Gideon ministry to continue. We'd ask that you would specifically pray for those hundred high school students that received New Testaments this week, that you would pray for the people who will be in the hotel rooms where Gideon Bibles are located. 
We pray that you would continue to lift up uh, the local Gideons as well as the Gideons around the country and, and around the world. One of the places that um, the Gideons have a very strong influence has been in the country of Brazil. Uh, the Gideons started distributing Bibles in Brazil back in 1958. And as of uh, just recently, uh, I think the, the total was about 212 million copies of God's Word. And a lot of those were done one-to-one, -one, just like I did at schools this week. But some of those were done in what the Gideons refer to as a scripture blitz. That's where they go to a particular area and they try to find as many people as they can and as many opportunities as they can to give away the scriptures. And in the two um, blitzes that have occurred in Brazil, uh, one was in 2012, one in 2022, over a million scriptures were distributed uh, in each one of those. The second way that you can be supported by the Gideon ministry is through giving. And there are a number of ways um, that you can give. One is to use the Gideon insert that uh, you may have gotten or they're available in the foyer that allows you to make a contribution either by putting che a check or, or cash into the envelope and either get, giving it back today or mailing it in. This um, bulletin also has information about um, how to use uh, an online site, um, the Gideon's International, as well as using the QR code. In addition to using um, that bulletin, one other way to give is through what we call Gideon cards. And these are uh, greeting cards of you know, a lot of different occasions, but the, the, the concept for the Gideon cards is very simple. Basically, the Gideons give you a free card. And then you can take the money that you would have paid for Hallmark or American Greeting or whatever. You can use that, and it goes towards purchasing Bibles. For every $5 that is contributed, one full Bible or four New Testaments can be distributed. These cards can be, be available. I have some available, and we can get some more if uh, the church would like to have those. So... You can be a part of the Gideons by praying, by giving. You can also actually take an active role in the Gideons. There are several ways to do this. One is by becoming an official friend of the Gideons. This allows you to receive additional information and updates about the Gideons. It also gives you the opportunity to participate in our Bible distributions. A special way that young people and students can participate in the Gideon ministry is by using what we call the life book. This is a resource that was developed about 10 years ago that basically contains an overview of the Old Testament as well as the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark. And it's written in the um, modern American uh, translation, which is very down to earth and, and useful for teenagers. The beauty of this particular tool is that the Gideons can give these to middle school and high school students, and we have uh, had about 3.5 million students that have accepted these in order to distribute them to their peers at school, on school property, during school, and they become an arm of the Gideon ministry. Over the last 10 years, 48 million copies of the life book have been distributed, and that's another way that God's word is able to get out. So I wanted to, to finish up by giving you um, a challenge. If you're a Christian business professional, I'm challenging you right here to, to seriously consider becoming a member of the Gideons. In Matthew 9, 37 through 38, it says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. The Gideons are always looking for additional field hands to plant seeds in this ministry. We really need you. If you are truly interested in making an impact on your community, then please see me after the service or at the meal that we're going to enjoy, and I'll be happy to get you some more information about the Gideons. I'd also love to tell you about some of the other uh, local uh, distributions that have happened, and I pray that you would... Uh, Ask me questions. I, I, I love to talk about what your local Gideon ministry um, missionaries are doing. I want to thank you 
uh, Roanoke Church of Christ. And thank you, Pastor Brian, for allowing us to be here today and to provide this update. Can we all pray together for the Lord and for the ministry and the Gideons? Heavenly Father, your word promises that you will cleanse us, that you will make us right, that as we stand before you, we can stand in the, clothed in the righteousness of your Son. And Lord God, your word says that you desire that all shall be saved. And Lord, I thank you for the ministry of the Gideons. I thank you for the heart of these men that you have placed among us, that, that they would go out, that they would lower pride and go into situations even if they, they know that they're not going to be received well, Lord God. Because just as for you, you left the 99 for the one, Lord God. We know that out there, every moment of every day, there is the one that's looking for hope, that's looking for you. And Lord God, we pray that you, you lift up the faces of those who feel as though they're not worthy to stand before you. And you lower the pride of those who feel as though they're as good as you. And Lord God, I pray that you equip this ministry of the Gideons, that they would seek them out. As you're doing a work and softening their hearts, Lord God, I pray that you would, you would make clear the paths of these men that go out to distribute your word. Lord God, I pray that you would embolden us. As Paul says, a, a one reaps, another sows, Lord God. And I pray that you would equip us, embolden us. Take away the fear of what it would be like to speak of your glory, your grace, and your excellencies. And Lord God, if you place it upon anyone's heart in this room, I pray that you would embolden them to speak with Richard that you would allow them to seek a way to serve you that's completely glorifying to you. Because, Lord, as many people will never remember Richard's name, they'll remember that moment that they came into contact with your word, and they'll give great praise and great glory when they found the moment of your love. Lord God, I thank you for Richard, and I thank you for his camp, and I thank you for the Gideons worldwide. I thank you for this day, and it's in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, we come to you. Amen. Amen.